So welcome everyone to this uh, probability session of the ICM. It's my great pleasure to introduce Daniel Remenik, my South American colleague from the University of Chile. Daniel gave uh, very important contributions to the study of the KPZ equation and for exact solutions of the TASAP. So today he will speak about integrable factorations in one dimensional random growth. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thanks, Claudio, for the introduction. Of course, it's, it's an honor and a, and a privilege to be um, presenting here. Um, so I want to start by, uh, to click here. So just giving a, a very brief outline of my talk. So I'm gonna start by uh, describing uh, very broadly uh, what's the KPZ universality class, at least some aspect of it, and in particular, the KPZ fixed point. Okay, so that, that's what I'm going to start with. And then uh, I'm going to introduce and discuss a little bit of a, a discrete model, uh, which is going to serve as the entry point to this uh, KPC universality class uh, in, in this talk, which is the polynuclear growth model. Uh, in the third part, I'm going to uh, describe how some integrable uh, partial differential equations come in uh, this picture for the KPC fixed point. And in the end, and depending on how much time I have, I'm gonna try to give you some ideas of how one proves uh, these things. Uh, so everything that I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work, several different joint works uh, with uh, Konstantin Metetsky and uh, Jeremy Kostel. So I'll get started. Okay, so uh, this talk is about one dimensional random growth. So here's a prototypical example of a model in one dimensional, in, in this class of one dimensional random growth that I'm interested in, and it's ballistic deposition. So what we have is we have the integer lattice and we have these boxes which fall down at rate one. So above every site, you have a Poisson process of rate one and you have these stacks of boxes uh, that just pile up. And well, if they were just falling independently uh, without any, in, any interaction, then you would basically just have a Poisson process of, of, uh, of, of boxes on every side, everything would be independent. And what the picture you would see, wouldn't be so interesting. So in this ballistic deposition model, uh, we have this sticking mechanism where a box falls down and sticks to the side of neighboring boxes. So for instance, this green box now, it, it sticks here, this one stuck over there, uh, this, this one didn't stick and it just fell and so on. Uh, so this is a simulation of the process starting uh, with a flat uh, initial interface. And you can see some of the main features of this of this interface, so it's it's a little bit rough, but not so bad, uh, and it has this lateral growth. You can see it in the in the simulation, right? You can see these sort of pieces that grow to one side or grow to the other side, and so on. And the physics conjecture uh, this dates back to uh, the late '80s <clears throat> is that if I look at this interface, so h of t comma x is uh, this green interface, then well, first of all, it should grow linearly in time. So it should move up at some linear speed. And then the most interesting part of the conjecture is that if I subtract this linear growth, uh, then fluctuations should be of the order of t to the third. Okay, So these fluctuations here are of order t to the one third. And uh, the, the fluctuations at different sites decorrelate at a scale of t to the two thirds. And in particular, then, if I rescale things correctly, so I subtract this linear growth, and I rescale by t to the third uh, the whole field, and I also rescale space with this t to the two thirds, then I should be converging to some process. Okay, uh, so that's the conjecture for this process. Um, so this ballistic deposition model is, a, I have to say, it's a conjectural member of the KPZ universality class. Uh, so what's the KPC universality class? It's a broad class of models, which includes stochastic one-dimensional interface growth, like this model or the Eden model or many others. Uh, there's some stochastic PDEs, uh, the most famous one being the KPC equation, uh, which I won't really talk about in this talk. Uh, some interacting particle systems like uh, exclusion processes, the TACEP, and directed random polymers, last passage percolation. And the point is that all of them have an associated height function, something like this, which you can define for the model. And for all these uh, models, you expect to have the same uh, behavior, OK? So for ballistic deposition, uh, it's conjectured to be in the class. It has not been proved. Basically, all that's known, and this dates back to, I think, the late 90s but in, a, in, in a result by Timo Sopalainen, is that um, there exists a linear growth, basically. There exists a, a linear speed. 
uh, that not even this C is known in the case of ballistic deposition. Okay, but anyway, for all these models, uh, one expects the same behavior, uh, but something uh, which is important about this class is that this behavior actually also depends on the initial condition. Okay, so here's a simulation of a different initial condition. So here I was starting with a flat initial condition. So you have boxes falling everywhere. And here you should think of this as boxes. So maybe this growth started over here. I just truncated the picture uh, with a single site. And then everywhere else, you should think that there's a cliff all the way to minus infinity. So you have these boxes falling down and they just fall down to minus infinity, uh, except for one over here or this little piece over here. And then they start growing and going outwards. And you can clearly see that the process cannot be the same as the process in the flat case because it has this parabolic uh, shape. So in the flat case, the conjecture is that these limits should be something called the one process, which I'm going to introduce in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, and in the case of this, and it's called the narrow wedge initial condition later on. Uh, it should be something called the every two process minus a parabola. So this deterministic shape, uh, you can see it in the limit. Okay, so, so the, the, the behavior actually depends on the initial condition. Okay, so maybe let me go back for a moment. Here I was taking T to infinity, okay? And I am seeing some spatial process in the limit. But actually it's more interesting. And in order to describe uh, the full KPZ universality conjecture, uh, to also keep track of time. So a way to keep track of time is that instead of taking T to infinity, what we do is you introduce uh, a different, uh, an extra parameter, uh, which I'm calling epsilon here, epsilon is going to zero, uh, which makes this T go to infinity in this way. So T is fixed, but epsilon is going to zero. So this parameter is going to infinity. And, uh, but the, the scaling is the same, okay? So it's, it's the same uh, ratios of exponents. And this is called the one, two, three KPZ scaling because of the, of the, ratios of the exponents. Here there's a half, here there's a two halves, and here there's a three halves. Okay, so this is called the KPZ one to three scaling, and here we keep track of time as well. And so the full KPZ universality conjecture is that for any model in the class, the height function, whatever the height function corresponds to in such a model, uh, when rescaled in this way, this one, two, three KPZ scaling, it should converge to some process uh, which should be universal. So that's, that's the conjecture, okay? And now this is really a process in T and X. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interface that's evolving in time. Um, of course, you have to assume that the initial condition converges suitably in some sense, uh, but if the initial condition converges, then you should have convergence to this process with some specific uh, initial condition. And this H T X is what's known as the KPZ fixed point. So this conjectural universal limit is uh, what's called the KPZ fixed point. And it was first constructed about five years ago in joint work of myself with uh, Matetsky and Questel. And the way we did it is we, com we constructed it as the one, two, three scaling limit of uh, this TASEP process, okay? So here there's a little picture. It's, it's just a particle system uh, and it has this height function that's associated to it. And if you take the scaling limit, uh, we were able to compute the scaling limit and show that it, that it actually is a Markov process and it defines the, this KPZ fixed point. And again, the way you should think about it is that you have some initial data and then at later times, you're seeing these, the, the way how this um, interface fluctuates, okay? Um, last thing I want to say here is that, okay, this is the KPZ universality conjecture, but you can also think of it, and, and I would better think of it as a definition, right? Once we know what this universal limit is, then we can define the KPZ universality class as the class of models which converge to this uh, universal limit. Okay, so that's another way of thinking about this. And maybe the one, the, the last little thing is that, of course, in in the scaling, uh, there's these constants that one has to put, and these constants here and the constant that tells you how fast the thing grows, uh, they are not universal. They, they they need not be universal. What's universal is the scaling, so this range, this one, two, three scaling, and uh, the scaling limit. Okay, so in order to try to say uh, how this appears a little bit more precisely, instead of talking about TASEP, I'm going to talk about this process that I already mentioned, the polynuclear growth process, or PNG for short. I'm going to be calling it PNG. Okay, and I should say that what I'm going to describe now is uh, work that's about to be posted very soon, hopefully. Uh, but really, the reason I am using this PNG process is that um, the formula that I'm going to show and the derivation, in a way, it's much simpler than for TASEP. Um, so it's it's a much 
easier and simpler way to try to introduce the ideas uh, behind this construction. Okay, so let me introduce the PNG process. Okay, so PNG is, again, we have a height function. This height function, okay, it lives on, the, the domain is R, uh, but it lives on Z, okay? So it's an integer valued height function. And it, the dynamics has two pieces, okay? So it's integer valued. Uh, so it has constant parts, it's piecewise constant. And every piece, every constant piece, every island like this, it's going to be expanding out deterministically at speed one, okay? So just a simple movement, it's, it's expanding out at speed one. And the random part of the dynamics is that, uh, Basically, uniformly in space and time, or more technically, at the at the points of a space-time Poisson point process of rate two, the rate two here is just a, a, a convenient normalization. Um, you have nucleations. So a nucleation is just a little point where you get a new step which starts expanding outwards. Okay. So here we have a nucleation. This is a nucleation that just occurred and it's it's moving outwards. Okay, and the last thing uh, that has to be specified is what happens when you have two of these islands uh, collide. Okay, so here they're about to collide. Uh, here they're even closer to colliding, and the the rule is that when they collide, they just annihilate. Okay, and now you have so here I have two islands, and then in a little bit of time they're just going to be one island. Okay, so they just merge upon colliding. So here's a simulation of the process started with this flat initial condition. So the, the, the process started with a fully flat interface, and then you started having some nucleations. And this is what you see a little bit later on. So again, the simulation uh, here, this is the, what, what, these dots here are the space-time Poisson point process. And at every every time you see one of these, you, you get a new nucleation, and, and this is the sort of process you see. Um, one thing I, I want to mention, uh, which is not so hard to see, but okay, it needs some work to prove, is that uh, you, you, can, you can ask yourself, what's the invariant measure for this process? And this is gonna play a role later. And the invariant measure for this process, at least one invariant measure of this process, uh, the, 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 there's a one parameter family of, of invariant measures all like this. Uh, it consists on having uh, up steps and down steps independently as Poisson point processes. Or basically you can think of it as just having uh, the path of the difference of two Poisson processes, okay? So it goes up at rate one and down at rate one. And if you just look at the interface, you, you, you sort of forget the, the global height and just look at the jumps, uh, that's invariant for the process, okay? You can sort of see that it looks a bit like that already in this simulation. Okay, so here's a, a different picture for the same thing. So this is again a picture for this PNG uh, process. Uh, but I'm starting with what I'm going to call the droplet or narrow wedge initial condition. Okay, so here I'm starting growth just from the origin. And this is like in the picture that I showed you before for ballistic deposition. E everywhere else you have minus infinity and you have this growth that starts going out outwards from the origin. Okay, um, so we have this sort of light cone going outwards. And uh, then there's these dots here, these blue dots are the creation event. So every time you have a creation event, you have a new island that's expanding outwards. And then every now and then, two of these islands are going to merge. And these are these uh, red crosses. And if you see the, if, if you suppose that this is the configuration of the space time Poisson process, I can just recover, of course, the height function. This is the, the corresponding height function uh, in this case. Okay. And, and you can, sort of see that uh, the height function, basically what it does is if I go down, I just count how many of these uh, curves I cross, okay? So here there's four, and here, for instance, there's just two, okay? So actually there's an alternative way of thinking about that, <coughs> which is uh, from the perspective of last pass percolation. So suppose I want to compute the height at this point, which is the origin. Well, first of all, I only need to look at these uh, backwards light cone going down. So I only need to look at the points inside this square because I can't reach anything else just because the, the growth is deterministic at speed one. And then uh, if, if you think about it for a moment, uh, actually this height four or the fact that I'm crossing four of these lines corresponds to the following problem. So now what I want to do is I want to start from the origin and go to time T and I want to find a path which goes at most in minus 45 or 45 degrees, or if you want, it's, I, I want to find a path which is Lipschitz one, okay? So 
with slope at most minus one, at, 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 between minus one and one. And I want to find what's the path that joins these two points in that way, which eats the larger number of cookies, okay? And the cookies are these points. Uh, so in this case, you can check that it's, it's this one, okay? So we have four. Uh, the, it's not unique in this case, but that's not important. So I could, from this one, I could have gone over here and then over there and it would be four again, okay? So this is just an instance of Poissonian last passage population, uh, last passage population being the usual uh, well-known model. And here the, the, the noise is, is Poisson. Um, and actually from this construction, one can, mm, it, it's not very hard to construct this PNG process uh, with a general initial condition. And the way you do it is through a variational problem like this. So basically now you start say from here and you try to go to the same point, but you give it an extra reward according to where you started from. And this is basically what this variational problem is saying, okay? Um, okay, wh why is this nice? Well, it's nice for several reasons, but here's a connection with an older, um, very famous problem, the problem of the longest increasing subsequence in a uniform random permutation. So the way to see this is the following. So I have the same picture again, and I'm gonna look at the picture in these two directions. So I'll call them eta and zeta, okay? And now you can look at the points you have in this square. So how many points do you have in this square? Well, it's a random number of points, uh, but it's a Poisson number of points. It's actually Poisson T squared, that's the parameter. And what you can do is you can order them according to the relative order between the zeta and the eta uh, directions. So for instance, this point here is the first point in the eta direction and it's the second point uh, in the zeta direction. Okay? And by, by doing that, this is the second point in the, this one is the second one and, and also the third one. I guess I missed a little line there. Um, but the point is that, uh, that defines for me a random permutation. So basically in this permutation, one goes to two, two goes to three and so on. No, no, it's not two that goes to two, but one goes to two, okay? So that defines for me a, a, a random permutation uh, of size n, n being the number of points inside the square. And uh, again, if you think about it for a little bit, uh, the, the, this, this length, the, this maximal number of cookies that I can eat along the way in this uh, Lipschitz one path, it's nothing but the length of the longest increasing subsequence in this uh, random permutation. Now, since I'm choosing Poisson points inside this square, uh, this is a uniform, this, uh, as a random permutation, it's chosen uniformly among all possible random permutations. So this is the famous problem of the length of the longest increasing subsequence in a uniform random permutation. Okay, so this, this was an old problem and it was proved after a lot of effort that the length of such a longest increasing subsequence in, in such a permutation is of order root n, it's actually a constant. Uh, that, that was a famous problem. Ulam's problem to determine this constant, it's two, okay? And then, uh, well, more than uh, almost 25 years ago now, Bag, Dijk, and Johansson proved this very, very famous problem, uh, uh, result that the fluctuations of this length around these two root n, basically uh, not large numbers, are of order n to the one sixth. And if you uh, rescale things correctly, so now you divide by n to the one six, uh, what you get is convergence to the Tracy William GUE distribution, okay? which was a big surprise. So what is the Tracy William GUE distribution? These are the asymptotic fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue of a Gaussian Hermitian random matrix. So it's a complex Gaussian matrix, uh, which is subject to be Hermitian. You look at them with some normalization, you look at the largest eigenvalue. Uh, and take a limit in, in the right scaling, and that's the Tracy William GUE distribution. And that's the same as the scaling limit of this. Okay, so of course, th th this, is a, this is a result which caused uh, a big steer uh, and which was the starting point of many of, of the things in the field. Um, okay, so we know this result for uh, the longest increasing subsequence in a uniformly random permutation, which corresponds to uh, through some mapping, uh, through the height of this PNG process. Okay, so the next thing you can ask for is, well, what happens now if I want to look at the whole process, not just at at, at one margin? And this is what uh, Prahofer and Spohn, and then Johansson a year later. This is near the, uh, I mean, in O2 and O3. Uh, this is what they did. So they looked 
at the whole process H, they rescaled them, they rescaled the process in, in the right way. Okay, so in those one, two, three scaling, taking T to infinity. And what they got is as a, as a limit, this ARI2 process minus a product. The, the same one that I showed you was the conjectural case for the for the ballistic deposition. The reason one, one conjectures that that's what one should see for ballistic deposition is that we know this to be true in at least one model, actually for several models, okay? So basically this is telling me that if I rescale around here, okay, and I take the limit, uh, I see this ARI2 process minus a parabola. So I have this parabolic shape and I also have this ARI2 process and this ARI2 process is a stationary process uh, and all of its marginals are tracing with on GU. Okay, so it's it's a very basic and important process uh, in KPZ. So this is the case of these, the, the case where you start growth from a single point. Later on, uh, Borodin, Ferrari, and Sasamoto could do the same analysis in the case of flat initial condition. And okay, so you, you do basically exactly the same uh, scaling and take a limit, okay, like in this simulation. And you get convergence to what I have called this ARI1 process. So again, the ARI1 process is stationary. And maybe surprisingly, now the marginals, so if I look at the distribution at one point, they are Tracy William GOE. So what, what's Tracy William GOE? It's the analog of the GOE distribution, uh, but now it's the largest eigenvalue of a real symmetric Gaussian matrix. Okay. Um, so somehow uh, random matrices are playing a role here. Uh, I should mention that, okay, I'm, I'm, what I'm stating here is the full result for the, for the spatial process, uh, but the fact that these were traced with GOE was known from before, from a paper of Bike and Brains uh, in the context of symmetrized random permutation. So it also has a connection with, uh, with, with, with longest increasing subsequence in random permutations, but in a symmetrized uh, uh, version. And <coughs> there's, In that decade, there was a lot of activity in getting similar results for many related processes, uh, many versions of TASE for exclusion processes for last passage population and so on. So this was very active and it remained so. Uh, and then during the last decade, there had been many, many extensions for more complicated process, uh, which are not exactly solvable like these ones. Uh, I haven't yet said what I mean by that. Uh, and and it, it really opened a huge line of, of research. Okay, But I should say that it's mostly or it was mostly, and in many of the cases, it, it remains being mostly restricted to the case of this narrow wedge initial condition where you start with a single point, okay? Some things can be done for flat, there's some little other things that can be done, um, but, but it's sort of restricted to that case. Okay, so here's, here's the, the result uh, which we can prove. So now again, I take this PNG model and I take the height function, and the fact is that we can take the limit of this process, okay? We can take it uh, with two, I mean, in, in two ways more generally than what I was saying before. So number one, uh, the initial data is now general. So you can take any initial condition for the PNG process. And as long as you uh, assume that it under diffusive scaling, it converges to uh, some limit, uh, then this height function is going to converge. And it's not only the height function at a fixed time, but actually we can do it with this one, two, three rescaling, okay? So actually we get convergence of the whole space-time field, if you want. And the limit is a Markov process, okay? And this is the Markov process that I was uh, describing before. Uh, this is the KPZ fixed point. Uh, and it's the same process we have constructed uh, with Matetsky and Costel uh, some years ago, okay? So it's, it's the same process you get uh, as a scaling limit of taste. So this result, this is basically, you could, you could replace PNG by TASER here, it would be, it would read the same. The result would, look, would, would read the same, okay? Now this version of the, of the, of the result for PNG, uh, it follows either from this work that I was mentioning with Matetsky and Postel, uh, and it also follows in a different way from work from last year by Dobernia and Virat, okay? Uh, now, what is this KPC fixed one? Okay, it's a Markov process which lives in this space of proper semi-continuous functions. Uh, the nice thing is, is that it has explicit transition probabilities uh, and they're given as fretum determinants. Okay, so I'm gonna describe these, uh, these formulas. 
but this connects to the integrability of the process, which is what I want to describe. Uh, but actually with these formulas, which are, depending on your point of view, they may be fairly complicated, but we can do things. So we can prove that it's locally Brownian in X. Uh, it's also known, this is not proof like that, but it's also known that Brownian motion is invariant modulo on global height. So this is like I was saying, the, the, the difference of Poisson processes is invariant for P and G in the limit that means that Brownian motion is invariant. Uh, there's an alternative uh, characterization of uh, the PNG, uh, sorry, of the KPC fixed point, uh, which is due to Doverny, Ortman, and Virac, uh, which is uh, it's different. It's a variational description. And well, this this result, if you restrict it to t equals one and you restrict it to this narrow wedge or flat initial conditions, then this corresponds to the ARI two or ARI one results I was showing in, in this slide. Okay, so it's it's the generalization of that. There's also been a lot of progress recently uh, in the question of universality, um, which is how can the, the question of trying to extend this limit to a broader class of models. So that, that's that's sort of the, uh, the one of the directions that people want to pursue to try to show that this is actually the scaling limit of many other models. And there's been progress on that. Uh, I wanted to mention that, but I'm not going to go about it uh, anymore. OK, so this is this is the theorem. Uh, and I was mentioning this issue of integrability. Okay, integrability can mean uh, a lot of things, uh, but let me try to say through an example what it will mean for me in, in, in the result that I want to show you. So this relates to what one could call the classical integrability of the Gaussian ensembles, this GOE and GOE. Okay, and th these are the, the famous results by Tracy and Widom from 94 and 96, which showed the following. They show that if you want to compute the distribution function of these GUE and GOE uh, random variables, so the probability that these random variables are less than R, um, well, they, there's more than one way to express it. But a very striking way is that they can be written as uh, in terms of, so it's just e to some integral of, of uh, basically given in terms of this function Q where Q is the solution of this ODE, okay? This is uh, the pi level two equation, okay? It's a certain solution which has to be chosen so that uh, with this boundary condition that the solution has to look like the area function as X goes to infinity. Uh, so th this, okay, th th this also caused a lot of stir and basically because there's, in principle, there's no reason to expect that these functions should satisfy such, a, such an ODE. Uh, this is a very important ODE in classical integral systems. It's one, it's one among the, the family of Pailevé equations. And this, uh, so, so this holds uh, in, in similar ways for narrow wedge or for flat in, in the context of KPZ, but in the context of random matrices, it corresponds to GUE and GUE. And there's many results uh, which expand this in many different directions uh, for special KPZ models, models which are uh, very much exactly solvable. Uh, but it's always mostly restricted to the narrow wedge initial condition, so, so or to the case of G. Okay, but then a, a, a natural question that one can ask, and that people uh, have asked, is uh, well, can you can you say anything more in the case of the KPC fixed point itself, or in the case of these uh, processes that arise? And the answer is that yes. So that's what I want to show you next. So let me define this function f to be the multipoint distribution function of this process H. So F of T, Xi's and Ri's is the probability. So I, I'm, I'm starting my KBZ fixed point with an initial condition H0, uh, which now it's going to be general. So any initial condition in, in some broad class. And I look at what's the probability that the interface after time T is below R1 at, time, at, at, at point X1, below R2 at point X2 and so on. And I'm going to try to see if I can say something about this F. And the answer is yes, we can say something. So this is a theorem with Costel from, uh, again, two or three years ago, um, that in the one point case, OK, I'm going to say something about the multipoint case in a bit. In the one point case, if I want to look at what's the probability that h of t comma x is less than r, uh, if I define this function f, and I look at the second logarithmic derivative of this f, I call that phi, then phi satisfies the kp equation. So this is another uh, completely integral equation. This is a completely integral PDE, uh, which comes 
it, it's actually uh, so so it, it's 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 a classical uh, integral PDE in, 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 in integral systems, uh, and physically it comes as a as a natural two-dimensional extension of KDV. So KDV is this, uh, this PDE for long waves in shallow water. But actually, it's it's the PDE sitting in here, uh, and this is the sort of two-dimensional extension of that. Um, so one can also ask oneself, what does uh, the random growth have to do with, um, with this problem of long waves in shallow water? Probably or possibly nothing. Uh, it's just what we get out of the uh, out of the formulas. Okay, but but it's still the point here is that this holds for any initial condition. Okay, and the the, the function just satisfies this PD. And there's a multipoint version as well. Okay, and the multipoint version is a little bit more complicated, but not so badly. So the way it goes is that now there's a there's a n times n matrix Q, okay, and this matrix Q and its derivative solve something called the matrix KP equation. So this is a non-abelian extension of uh, the KP equation. Actually, if you take n equals one in this equation, it's it's fairly easy to see that you get back. Uh, the, 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 the scalar KP equation. Uh, and in this case, there's this matrix Q, which solves the matrix KP equation. And then to make the connection with the KPZ fixed point, you compute the trace of Q, and that gives you the derivative of the log of F at, at time T. Okay, so uh, this is the general version of this uh, result. Here's a corollary, uh, which, which establishes in a way the connection with random matrices. And the corollary is the following. So take now uh, H, the, take it the initial condition to be flat. So th this was all for, in, for general initial condition. Uh, but now consider the case of flat initial condition, where if you take the flat initial condition, then, well, the, the, this initial condition is translation invariant, of course, it's just flat. And uh, the, the dynamics is also translation invariant. So you should expect, and, and it's, it's actually, it is like that that um, the KPZ fixed point will be translation invariant uh, for every positive T. So this phi should be translation invariant. So you should, it, it's natural for look, to look for solutions of KP which have this form, basically, which don't depend on X and also, and also which respect this um, one, two, three scaling of the KPZ fixed point. Uh, so if you do that, you define things like this uh, and you plug back in this psi in this KP equation, and then you make this transformation, nearest transform, then you're going to get an ODE for Q. And the ODE you get is the finally the two equation. And if you plug everything back in, in, in these formulas, uh, what it tells you is that F in this case, so if I look at the distribution of the KPC fixed point started with flat initial condition at time one, uh, that actually satisfies this formula, which is the one I had shown you for GOE. So basically what this is telling you is that uh, well, for in the flat case, and the same thing works in the narrow wedge case, uh, the reason, or at least one way to see why these random matrix uh, distributions show up in KPZ is because this random growth in a way is being governed by this KP equation. And in these special cases, which are self-similar, uh, the right or the correct self-similar solutions to these equations are exactly given by pi leve and, and through this pi leve we get GOE. So basically, it's just by self-similarity, and you check that the, the self-similar solutions that correspond to this initial data uh, are these uh, Tracy Widom GOE and GOE distributions. So it gives you a way of understanding what's so special about uh, these, these special distributions that show up in these cases. Okay, so let me try to describe, maybe to go back for a moment, so the way these formulas are proved, these, these equations are proved, is by using the explicit Fretham determinant formulas uh, that I was mentioning we have for the KBZ fixed point. So let me try to describe those. Uh, and I'm gonna do it for P and G, okay? Because the way we get those for the KBZ fixed point is by taking limits of, of uh, discrete models. So in this case, I'm gonna do it with P and G. So here's P and G again. So first of all, I'm going to restrict to the case of one point distributions uh, because it's just because it's simpler to describe, but there's similar uh, multipoint formulas. Uh, so in the case of multipoint distributions, we, we can write similar things. So the formula has the following form. Uh, I, I want to write down a formula for the one point distribution of this height function, the probability that P and G at time T at, at X is less than R. 
and it's going to be given by a freedom determinant. Okay. So what's a freedom determinant? Well, okay, it's going to be the freedom determinant of the identity minus some kernel. This is the kernel of an integral operator acting in L2 of z. It's actually z restricted to uh, those integers which are larger than r, r being the same r there. Okay. And the freedom determinant is just the natural infinite dimensional uh, extension of the finite dimensional determinant, but it has this explicit form. So k is an integral kernel, it has some kernel, and the way you compute the determinant is as an infinite series of multiple sums of determinants of n by n matrices made out of this kernel. Okay? The formula for us won't be very uh, important, uh, but it, you should think of it as a determinant of a matrix, but this matrix is not really a matrix, it's, it's, it's really the kernel of, a, of, an, of an infinite dimensional operator. So I have to tell you who this kernel is, okay? I told you it's the, the, the formula is through the fragment determinant of a kernel. I have to tell you what the kernel is. So here's the kernel. Okay, so, so introduce the kernel. I have to introduce a couple more things. So uh, nabla of F is going to be the symmetrized discrete difference operator, F of X plus one minus F of X minus one divided by two. And this delta is gonna be the discrete Laplacian, F of X plus one minus two of FX plus F of X minus one. And I need to introduce a certain random walk. So this random walk, it's gonna be a symmetric right one nearest neighbor random walk on the integers uh, or said differently. It's just the difference between two independent rate one plus one processes. So this is the same uh, model, the, the same process I was saying uh, gives you the invariant measure for PNG. Okay, it just jumps up and down uh, with rate one. Notice also that this Delta here, this operator is the generator of this process. Okay, so if, you, if you want to generate such a process, this is just the generator of the difference of two uh, of, of, of two Poisson process. Okay, and now I need to introduce this heat probability. Okay, so first I I fix a certain function h zero. It's not any function. It's really the function that is the initial data for PNG. So here it is, and this kernel. Uh, it depends on two by, uh, on two times a and b, and it's what's what's drawn here. So basically, what I want to do is I want to start at u, and I want to ask what's the probability that this random walk it's going to end at v, and it's going to go below the graph of uh, this function h zero. So originally, I want to I, I want to compute the probability that um, at some point this PNG process is going to be below something. I, I sort of turn it around and now I ask what's the probability that this random walk it's going to go below uh, the, a certain curve, the curve being uh, the initial data for the process. Okay, so you compute this thing. So that this is my P hit. And then I need to introduce this uh, one more uh, operator, which is TAB, which is basically this hit probability uh, conjugated by these semigroups made out of this uh, discrete Laplacian. Okay, so that defines for me a certain kernel. And now to tell you who's this k, k of t comma x, it works as follows. So I compute this, this sort of heat probability going from time x minus t to x plus t. Okay, and I conjugate it by these semigroups over here, which involve the two operators that I described, this first difference and this second difference operator, and that's k. And then the recipe is that you compute these heat probabilities, okay? You then compose with these other very explicit kernels, okay? That gives you k, you plug k back in this determinant, and that gives you the freedom determinant over there. So how, how does one get to something like this, okay? So the way we got it is as follows. So we got it by taking a scaling limit of a different model called, uh, it's a discrete time version of TASEP. It's, it's TASEP with parallel update. So this is in, in a recent uh, work with Matetsky. Uh, we did that using uh, a, a method called biorthogonalization or that has come to be known as biorthogonalization. It's a sort of algebraic method. It's, it's also the way we had first uh, obtained these scaling limits of TASEP. Uh, so we were able to get formulas which look uh, very much like the ones I showed you, a, a bit more complicated. Uh, so the ones I showed you for PNG, there's similar formulas for the high function of TASEP with parallel update. And actually TASEP with parallel update, uh, there's a scaling limit which actually takes it to PNG, 
Okay, it's not the one to three scaling limit. The one to three scaling limit is the KPV fixed point, uh, but there's a sort of intermediate limit that takes you to PNG. And by taking that scaling limit, uh, we could derive the formulas that I showed you. But actually, once you have the formula, uh, you can try to prove it directly. Okay, so you don't need all this algebraic uh, machinery. Uh, and it turns out that this can be done. And it sort of gives an idea of what's going on. So that's what I want to uh, describe really very briefly, not, not in any detail. So basically, once I have a candidate formula for F, okay, one way to check that it is the right thing is to check that it satisfies the Kolmogorov equations, in this case, the backward equation. Okay, So that's what I want to show you more or less how it can be done. So here's my candidate function, determinant of I minus K. K is this kernel that I described. And what I have to do is I have to show that the time derivative of this function equals the generator applied to this function. Okay, so I want to compute dt minus the generator applied to the determinant. Uh, but then you use properties of the determinant, which are uh, the, the, the usual properties. And that tells you that actually it's enough. Uh, so just I'm simplifying many of the steps, but basically you can check to that it's enough to check the backward equation for the kernel itself. Okay, now, the kernel itself is fully explicit. It's the one I gave you here. It depends on these heating probabilities, but you can dream that you can do something about it. So, so now I have to try to, to show this, okay? So here's the time, the, the T derivative of K, it's basically uh, this, okay? So it, 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 it may look complicated, but all I'm doing is that I'm differentiating this T over here on the left, and this t over there on the right. And then you have to check that the t appearing in the middle doesn't do anything. So I have a very explicit formula for the time derivative of the kernel. And on the other hand, this generator, well, this is the backward equation. So really the generator is being applied to the initial data. And the only part of k that depends on the initial data is this heating probability part. So basically I can put in my generator inside. So now I have to check that this blue part equals that blue part. Let me just give you the very basic idea of what's going on. So you see, L is the generator is being applied to the to this initial condition. Okay. And I'm asking what's the probability that a certain random walk hits this initial condition. Okay, but this random walk is actually the law of this random walk is invariant for P and G. Okay. So what turns out is that you can use a certain time reversibility property of uh, P and G to basically integrate by parts. And what you can do is you can throw the action of this generator, which originally it acts on this initial condition. You can throw it onto the random walk, basically, or the random walk path, the one I'm asking to hit. Uh, somewhere. And when you do that, you end up basically applying the generator of P and G to uh, a path which is being integrated against the invariant measure. Okay, so it's the, the generator of, of like something integrated against the invariant measure that should be zero, right? That, that just that's the definition of invariant measures. But um, it's not zero because I'm in a finite box, so I'm going to have some boundary terms, and these boundary terms actually give me exactly this. And you can do this, and, and you can implement it, and, and it works, and it gives you uh, this backward equation. Okay. So how, how does one go from this PNG process to the KPZ fixed point? Well, you have to take a scaling limit, right? Um, so the scaling limit works as follows. It's actually, so to prove it, it's not so hard. Uh, it's not so easy. It's very technical, but to see what's going on, it's not so hard. So basically I have these, these differences of Poisson processes, X, and in the one to three scaling limit, space is getting rescaled uh, diffusively. So it goes to a brown in motion. So now my heating probability for, uh, for this uh, random walk becomes heating probabilities of a Brownian motion. And this is this, this uh, Brownian scattering operator that I'm uh, introducing here. So very brief, it, it's just the idea now I, instead of hitting the initial data for PNG, I hit the initial data for the KPC fixed point by a Brownian motion. Um, this discrete Laplacian is just going to the continuous Laplacian. So in the limit, I get this heat kernel. And this last part, it actually, in, in, in the scaling that we're looking at, it becomes uh, a third derivative plus a certain shift. And the shift goes away uh, by the scaling. So uh, what we get in the end is a formula which looks very much the same. So you have this Brownian scattering operator in the middle and you have it surrounded by 
these um, explicit semigroups, okay? And this is the formula for the KPC fixed point. And the nice thing is that the, all the complicated dependence on the initial data is sitting inside here. And the dependence on T and X is simple through these conjugations by these uh, explicit semigroups. So then by differentiating the determinant and using this explicit formula, and then you can suffer through, through a long computation and you get to these KP and these matrix KP equations. Okay, so with that, I'm stopping and thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Danielle, for this very nice talk. Congratulations for being invited to the ICM. And I hope to see you soon. There is no time for questions. So thank you all for coming. Goodbye.